Hello and welcome to Supposedly Fun. My name is Greg. It is time for a Friday Reads video. I've had a little bit of time, so I figured I would film one. Again, I'm probably not going to be able to upload it until Saturday, but odds are you wouldn't have watched this on Friday anyway, so it doesn't really matter, except that I am filming it on Friday. I managed to get part one of my 3K Q&A posted earlier this week. Thank you for the nice comments I've had on that, and I'm hoping to get part two and some more want this, some more of those uh, posted soon. We will see how that goes. A lot of people had nice wishes for my foster son who had surgery this week. Thank you for that. Uh, he is doing great. Actually, I just realized I still have my uh, visitor wristband on because we have to take him home later today. He's doing great. So thank you for all of the well wishes. That, uh, that has been the big thing hanging over the week. As a result, I also didn't get a whole lot of reading done, but we'll check in about the reading at the end. In the meantime, I want to just let you know more Q&A will be coming. I have a longer list of the comments and things, so I'll be, I'll be getting to more soon. I'm trying to decide if I want to be a little bit, stay kind of, I was very chatty. I talk a lot. I don't know if you've noticed that. I talk a lot. So I'm trying to decide if I want to continue being chatty and drag out the number of parts that are going to be in the Q&A or just try to, you know, rapid fire, get through some questions. I haven't made, I haven't decided. It's easy for me to tell myself that I'm going to be succinct and to the point and then I'm not. So odds are I'll continue being chatty whether I choose to or not. So but we'll see how that goes. I also wanted to say, I, I so I've noticed lately in the last two or maybe even three months, I have gotten a little lax in keeping up with comments on videos and I'm going to be trying to do better about that because the comments are honestly, I, the communication in everything is the main reason I have a channel. So if I'm not responding to comments, I'm missing out on a lot of that. So I, it's just got, with work and the pandemic and the fact that there are more people commenting now, it's, it's gotten to be a lot to keep up with but I'm going to be working to do better about that. So please bear with me. And if you have left a comment, please, I'm, I'm going to try to be better about responding. I also have gotten out of the habit of leaving comments on other people's videos because I used to always leave a comment just to let people know, hey, I was here. <laughs> um, so I felt like I had to, find, had to find something to say. And I don't really do that anymore. Now I watch the video and, and like the video, but I don't always leave a comment. So. I'm trying to decide if I should get back into leaving comments on everything myself. I don't know. It was just not, not a whole lot of important <laughs> anything for you to know, except I, I'm actually kind of curious. Do you comment on every video you watch or selectively pick and choose? I don't know. I've, for me, it, it does start to feel like, like an acknowledgement, like, hey, I was here. I liked this, con uh, this content. Thank you for doing it. I don't know. It's, it's interesting. So I'd be curious what you think about that. As I said, I did not get a whole lot of reading done this week. I did manage to get a lot of listening done. I bailed on an audiobook, but we're going to be talking about that later. I, between ending that book and starting another one, I was listening to a podcast, Nice White Parents, which is the new podcast from the makers of Serial. I loved the first season of Serial, did not really like the second season. And the third season was interesting, but it is very different from the previous two seasons. And that's, it was meant to be a departure, but I'm still always curious about what Serial does. I really loved the uh, other podcast they did, S-Town, that uh, was kind of like not, they didn't have a brand at that time, but they, they do now. They've uh, partnered with the New York Times to create um, like Serial productions for podcasts. Uh, and if you haven't listened to S-Town, please listen to it. It is so good. Their new podcast is called Nice White Parents, and it is really good. It is infuriating. It is really interesting. So I'm really enjoying it. I'm a couple of... I had fallen behind. They release new episodes weekly, but I had uh, fallen behind, so I got to binge a couple of them this week, and I'm really looking forward to staying caught up with it. So if you need a podcast recommendation, I would say check out Nice White Parents. It is really interesting. The premise is, it's very much about schooling and integration in America and how in the North in particular, there has been segregation, but it wasn't this in the same form that segregation took in the South. It was much more informal, frequently based on zoning in rural, uh, urban areas versus suburban areas and things like that, and who has access to, to those schools. And just by zoning, 
you can segregate without actually having laws about it or separate separate schools or anything like that. So it the trailer that I had heard focused in on what was actually the second or even the third episode where the city of New York was going to create a new public school and white parents were writing letters and telling them don't build it where you want to build it, build it closer to our neighborhood because if you build it closer to our neighborhood the school will be integrated. We will send our kids there and we want integration. It's going to be great. So eventually they did build the school where the white parents wanted it and yet none of the white, not a single one of the white parents who wrote those letters ended up sending their kid to that school. And they do manage to, even though that happened in the 1960s, they do manage to interview some of the parents who had written those letters to find out why, if you believed in integration, did you not end up sending your kids to this school? And it tackles, it's like a really complex issue because then their parents, some of the parents talk about realizing that they're, I don't want to give everything away, but some of the parents talk about uh, once it became more of a reality, they realized that there was a difference in education between their kids and the kids who, uh, from the black and Latino families that would be coming in and they were worried that their child's education would suffer. And it kind of grapples with the idea of the difficulty of integration, but also the necessity for it, like figuring out these problems. And part of the problem is that nobody has really figured them out because these problems still exist. The person who uh, created the podcast came up with the idea because she was touring public schools in New York City and realized that as she was going on the tour, she was not, all of the students were uh, from like black families, Latino families and things like that. And then finally they saw white children when they were taken to see one of the gifted classes. And none of the other parents on the tour were asking questions about it, but she as a journalist started to wonder what's going on here. And it's it's very interesting. It's very infuriating. I recommend it. I've talked about it a lot at this point. So if, if you're interested in a podcast, I recommend it. It's Nice White Parents from the makers of Serial. And I have a, one other kind of topic I've been thinking about, but I'm going to tie it into discussion of what I've been reading this week so far. So I mentioned that I bailed on something. Let's get to the bail first. It was, on, it was an audio. I was listening to Hondo by Louis L'Amour, if you remember from last week. And I, at the time, when I did my Friday reads last week, I wasn't really liking it. Louis L'Amour is a great writer, but it has all of those tired Western cliches and kind of toxic masculinity that make the genre of the, of the Western seem kind of problematic in the first place. So I was committed to finishing it, but I was really dragging my way through it this week and struggling with it and just really not really having a hard time but I got to a point where I had I think an hour and a half maybe two hours left in the audio I'm pretty sure it was an hour and a half and you know no spoiler I think what finally broke me was that it's like I said it really perpetuates these traits of toxic masculinity with Hondo and by the way that it always refers to Hondo as Hondo Lane like his full name and I don't know why but even that bothers me but anyway so it kind of ties into these, but then Hondo has this dog that he's had for 11 years. The dog is murdered. First of all, I have problems with books and movies where dogs are put in danger or die or, or anything like that because um, I have two dogs and I don't want to think about that. So I really struggle with that baseline, but the way, the fact that the dog was used as a red shirt to show how, you know, like we already knew the villain was a bad guy. We didn't need him to do that to show how bad he is. Also the villain is a Native American, which is, so, which is part of how you can see where it ties into all this problematic representation that the Western genre frequently falls into. But anyway, so the, the dog gets murdered, and the female character tells Hondo about it, and he just shrugs and says, well, there's an old dog, and keeps going. And it's meant to show how tough he is, but it's like, screw you, dude. It wouldn't hurt you to be a little upset that your companion of 11 years just got murdered. 
to show how dangerous the situation is. It's, it's so I, I I was really upset. I bailed on that book. Don't care what happens in the end. We'll not be watching the movie version. I think the movie version stars John Wayne, who's kind of like toxic masculinity embodied in a person. So yeah, I think that's enough about Hondo. I bailed hard, and I'm not looking back anytime soon. Probably not anytime way into the future either. It will be what it is. I think Louis L'Amour seems like a great writer, but I don't think I need to experience any more <laughs> of that. I had kind of wanted to try a more traditional genre western to go along with the ones that I have managed to read this year as part of my Read Outside Your Comfort Zone, which are True Grit, Lonesome Dove, and I guess technically you could count Inland by Teo Brett, but I really just call it, keep it at uh, True Grit and Lonesome Dove. And, uh, yeah, I don't think I need to do the kind of stereotypical or common, more popular Western books. I think I'm good now. <laughs> I think I am going to be just fine. So I did finish Hamnet by Maggie O'Farrell. And I wanted to do a video review of it this week. But obviously with everything going on, I did not have a chance to. I did manage to write a review of it, which I haven't done in a while and felt kind of nice to do. I will link the written review down below. I will talk about it on this channel at some point. Even if I don't give it a standalone review, I'll talk about it a little more. I loved it. I really loved it. It is, if you watched part one of my 3K Q&A, which I will also link down below, I said it is in contention for my top spot of the year and I still haven't really decided how to handle that because I have this emotional reaction to Hamnet and I'm on a high with it since I only recently finished it, but I have this intellectual reaction to Song of Solomon by Toni Morrison, and I don't know right now which one will ultimately win out by the end of the year. So we're gonna have to figure that out as we go. But I really, really loved it. If you're unfamiliar, Hamnet is the story of William Shakespeare's wife. And it's really interesting to try to look into it and how Maggie O'Farrell wrote the books, because there are a lot a lot of parts of Shakespeare's life and his family's life especially that are kind of blank. History didn't record a lot of details about them. So, and I really am, I think it's fascinating how Shakespeare is in the book but he is never named. And his family is named and you know that his family's surname is Shakespeare but she never names him. And he is really only in flashbacks for the most part. So you have this kind of unnamed husband who only really appears in flashbacks. It's almost like in Little Women how the March sisters are kind of pining for their father. But what it does is it kind of, it gives the stories of Shakespeare's wife and his children back to them. Because you really only ever hear about them through the prism of Shakespeare. And instead, you see him through the prism of his family, which is really interesting. But that's the small part of the story. It's really about how their son Hamnet died young. The history didn't record why, but in this book it envisions um, plague. So, and how it inspired Shakespeare to write Hamlet eventually in some of his great plays, but really it's about the emotional toll on the family. And it's just a very, very good book with beautiful language. I, I very much recommend it. And uh, I am particularly attuned to the idea of like giving people their story back when it's, they've traditionally only been viewed through somebody else, especially when that somebody else is male. It's why I really liked The Five by Hallie Rubenhild last year. And if you haven't read that, I definitely recommend it. That is a book that is about the victims of Jack the Ripper and not about Jack the Ripper. And it's a, Hallie Rubenhold went through and did a lot of research, tried to piece together their lives because it's so difficult to try to get information about people who weren't rich at the time. So she tries to piece together who they were, how they lived, and what led up to their murder. But it does not discuss Jack the Ripper or speculate about who he is. So it gives them their stories and their agencies back. And I just, I really love that. So Hamnet was great. And I will talk more about it. Uh, I'm really looking forward to talking more about it, but I will, in the meantime, I will link my written review of it down below if you are interested in that. I was supposed to start some of my booktube reading, booktube prize reading for in, in, in this month, week, but um, I didn't do it. And part of that is because with all the stress going on, I just didn't really feel like it, especially since some of the titles are a little bit heavy. 
the audiobook that was immediately available was In the Dream House by Carmen Maria Machado, and I just didn't feel mentally, emotionally ready for it, so I started listening to The Court Dancer by Kyung Suk Shin instead. I am trying not to look into details of the book so much. I, I, I always have this idea that I want to go in and have a book surprise me, and I'm going to try to do that with this one. All I really know is that it is based on a true story, and once I'm further along or once I finish, I need to try to look into what the true story of it is. And I think that's a really interesting, because the only book by Kyung Suk Shin I have read so far was Please Look After Mom, which is a contemporary, or set in contemporary time. So this is a very different type of book. And I'm really excited. I'm, I'm not too far into it yet, but I, I think it's much more escapist. For me, plus it would it it's Women in Translation Month, and I really want to get something in that qualifies for that. So, the Court Dancer, it is, and I'm really looking forward to getting further along in it. And I was going to also try to pick up. Uh, there are some eBooks of other books that are uh, for the Book Two Prize nonfiction finals uh, available through Scribd. Solitary and No Visible Bruises. I didn't feel emotionally ready for either one of those either. <laughs> But I had a NetGalley copy of The Bass Rock by E.B. Wilde available, so I kind of started that. And I want to, I'm gonna need to get further into it. I am only maybe 75 pages in, but I'm having a hard time getting started. And I'm trying not to know a lot about that book too. I did skim, just like quick look through uh, the premise of the book because I was having such a hard time getting into it. Because sometimes this, that seems to be what happens every time I want to go into a book without knowing anything. I end up kind of struggling to get started and then I think to myself, okay, what is this about? So I, I, I did kind of peek and I think knowing the premise will hopefully help because if I get through some of the setup, hopefully there will be payoff further along. I read All the Birds Singing by Evie Wilde and I remember liking it until the ending. I think the ending is what let me down about that book, but her writing was great. So I'm hoping to see a little bit more of that as I get further further into it. Uh, and then there is Blonde by Joyce Carol Oates, my buddy Reed with Britta Bowler. And I did not get much of any reading done in this week. So Britta and I have agreed that we'll see how if we get um, get any further into it over the weekend and maybe do our have a check-in on Sunday. The shorthand version of the catch-up is that, so for the first hundred pages, I liked it, but saw potential that I wouldn't like it. For this, for page 100 to 200, I didn't, I, I, I didn't like it and was going to continue with it, but kind of wanted to wait and see where it went from there. So I haven't, I, I haven't made much of any progress. I think I maybe got 10 pages into page uh, 200 to 300. So we're going to see. A lot of this remains to be seen because the thing Britta and I talked about is that this is a big chunk of a book and both of us have a lot of other things on our reading plates and are just our plates in general right now. So we're going to see if the next 100 to 200 pages improve and if they don't, we might just leave this alone. But... That's where, where, where I'm at with Blonde by Joyce Carol Oates right now. It's just, it's been a week. It's been a long week in a lot of ways. I'm glad it's almost over and there's a light at the end of the tunnel on that. And hopefully next week will be a little bit easier. And I'd love to hear what you've been up to, what you've been reading. And if, if you have any thoughts about any of the stuff that I've read or any of the stuff that I've said, please, 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 please leave a comment down below. If you've read The Bass Rock, I'm very interested in your thoughts about it because, like I said, I, I'm kind of struggling to get started, but I also don't really know if that's just because of everything going on and how busy things have been or if it's really the book. So I would be very curious. Please let me know if you've read The Bass Rock, which I think is only going to be published in the U.S. later this month. But uh, yeah, I, I have a copy on NetGalley, so... That's fun and exciting, and I really, I am, I was really looking forward to that book. So I'm hoping it does pick up a little bit, but we'll see, and we'll see about a lot of things. So I think that's probably enough. I can leave it there. As always, I really appreciate your time, especially if you've made it to this point. Thank you. If you subscribe and follow along, thank you again. You are the best. And as you, as always, I will be back. Until next time, happy reading.